This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. When Jeffrey Schmaltz of the New York Times died in 1993, he was remembered by President Bill Clinton. He was a remarkable man who interviewed me in a very piercing way uh, last year when I was running for president. He challenged us all with these words in the article, I am dying, why doesn't someone help us? I have to say to you that I think that is a good question and a good challenge. Jeff Schmaltz was dying of AIDS when he wrote that article, and his story and many, many others that he wrote for the Times over a period of a few short years since he took ill changed the way America thought about the AIDS crisis and the people who died from the disease. His work also changed the way journalists covered the epidemic, stripping away cold objectivity in favor of blunt, first-person narrative. Today, where we live, conversation with a friend and colleague at the Times, Sam Friedman, who, along with public radio producer Carrie Donahue, have produced Dying Words, the AIDS reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz. Sam Friedman is a professor of journalism at Columbia. He's written a book of the same name. And Sam Friedman, welcome to Where We Live. Thanks so much for having me, John. It's great to be with you. First of all, describe who Jeff Schmaltz was to you, your relationship. Jeff Schmaltz had, I think, two complementary roles in my life. First of all, purely journalistically, he was my mentor and my kind of newsroom protector and guardian when I was a baby reporter on the New York Times, actually based in the Connecticut Bureau in the early 1980s. So he was what we called a rabbi, which was uh, an affectionate term for an editor who would really kind of look out for you, who'd help you get great assignments, help those assignments get great play, and give you the kind of really rigorous, thoughtful editing that if you were coming from a relatively small paper to the Times, as I was making a really big leap to help you manage that that transition, which could otherwise defeat people. You really needed someone to guide you, and he was that person for me. And then separately or kind of interdependently with that, Jeff was the first comfortably out gay person I knew in my life. You know, one of the great influences in my life going back to high school was a wonderful high school teacher in English and journalism and drama named Robert W. Stevens, who in our small town in in central New Jersey, everyone knew Mr. Stevens was gay, but it couldn't be stated. And he was someone almost a kind of sadly textbook example of someone who became incredibly self-destructive, I think, with the pressure of being closeted year after year after year weighing on him. And then there were people I worked with on other newspaper jobs who came out later on but weren't out when I knew them, didn't feel it was safe to be out. And so here's Jeff in 1982 when I'm just starting on the New York Times who mentions in this very matter-of-fact way while we're having lunch one day that he's gay and it's not tortured, it's not apologetic, it just is what it is the way someone else might say, you know, I'm Irish Catholic or, you know, I'm I'm Jewish or, you know, my family's from the Dominican Republic. Very ordinary, which was in a way that I think is hard for current listeners to understand, so liberating for a straight person like me to hear that. And what did that mean to you at the time? You're 26, 27 years old at that time, and you're saying that essentially this is the first openly gay person that you've ever really met, and here's someone who is also a mentor to you, someone who you look up to. What did that mean to you in the way that you imagined what it might then mean to be gay in America today? I think it was a transitional point for me in how I thought about being gay in America You know, I think for a lot of people who grew up with liberal values, which I certainly include myself in, for a long time, I I don't want to say that um, homophobia was the acceptable prejudice for us, although it could certainly go into that with some people, but there was still a sense of kind of shame or pity that you felt for someone who was gay or that they had to live a la Mr. Stevens, my great teacher, a really tormented, conflicted life. And so it was brand new information for me to be with a gay person who was so important to me, but also, as far as I could tell, was so at home with himself. Now, John, the interesting thing is that until Kerry Donahue and I started working on Dying Words by now 18, 20 months ago, I had assumed that Jeff Schmaltz was out to everybody at the Times. I thought I was going to work on a book and a radio doc about not only this transformational AIDS journalist 
who died too young of AIDS, but also about someone who'd been one of the first out journalists in the Times. It actually was a lot more complicated. I didn't know that till later, but what Jeff did, which I was part of, is for his own comfort level and I think for his way to try to stealthily make positive change at the Times, he would find young, straight journalists. You know, now there's this term allies. You know, you say, like, I'm a queer ally or an LGBT ally. No one had that language then, but there was the same idea. Jeff was looking for allies, and a lot of us young reporters, people in our mid to late 20s, were the ones who Jeff sized up correctly and would come out to and not only would change us by being around him, but would change the paper by having us write articles that could not have been written by any reporter who might have been known or suspected to be gay because in the climate of the New York Times, and that would have looked like special pleading or favoritism. But if one of us straights did it, it got under the radar. Mm. Maybe before we we talk a bit about his transformative AIDS writing and some of the, the changes that, of course, happened in his life that brought this to everyone's attention, talk a bit more, if you would, Sam, about him as a journalist. He talks about being a Times man, someone very committed to this institution, and clearly, as as you've just said, someone who probably knows it well enough to know how to make certain things happen behind the scenes, obviously understood the ins and outs of this great newspaper at least as well or better than anyone. That's a great question. Jeff was a prodigy, and he was a total creature of the New York Times, which was a mixed blessing, as I'll get to in a moment. But in terms of what a prodigy he was, here's someone who gets hired as a copy boy at 19 while he's at Columbia, and within a year is a full-time copy editor on the New York Times and actually drops out of Columbia um, at age 20 to go to work on the copy desk. That just didn't happen. If you were really connected, if you had, you know, gone to Harvard or Yale and been chosen to be, you know, a copy boy attached to a major New York Times editor or columnist, then maybe you'd get onto the paper at age 21 or 22 after you got out of undergrad, and in a couple of years, you'd be made a copy editor or a reporter. It was completely unheard of that someone who, you know, came out of, you know, an obscure, ordinary background in kind of the middle class suburbs of Philadelphia who had no connections to the Times, just on pure merit, would be working there full time at age 20. And Jeff was just preternaturally skilled, detail minded, committed, someone who completely absorbed the Times ethos of reporting without fear and favor, being the paper of record, all of those things. So what amazed me is I got onto the Times at what was a relatively young age, just past uh, my 26th birthday, and I was so happy to be a reporter up in the Bureau in Stamford, Connecticut then. Jeff was about two years older than me, and he was already the de facto city editor of the whole paper. He had a different title, but he essentially ran the New York City and suburban coverage of the Times at that age and had been doing so even even earlier. What's the mixed blessing of it that I referred to before is that Jeff was such a great editor and such a devotee of the orthodoxies of New York Times style that he once confided to me that when he moved into reporting, which he knew he did want to do, he said his concern was that he'd only know one way to report, which was sort of the the by-the-book New York Times way. And he was someone who also was unwilling to challenge some of the times his small-mindedness. Um, one time when I'd had a dry spell, I hadn't had a story that got really good display in the paper for a few weeks, he gave me an assignment to write a story out of Yale because he knew the Yale stories always got great display in the Times. And sure enough, it got all splashed all over the Metro front page. And I was having lunch with Jeff uh, soon after that, and I said, you know, I'm really thankful that you gave me that Yale story that got such great play. But, you know, Jeff, I grew up near Rutgers in New Jersey, and I know a lot of people in Connecticut who went to UConn, and a lot of those people read the New York Times too. And, you know, we could do really good stories that should get well played out of places like Rutgers and UConn. And without any irony, Jeff said to me, when you read the New York Times, you expect to see a Tiffany ad and you expect to see a Yale story. <laughs> 
And I think it also, this feeling of absorbing everything the Times was about, including its prejudices, was also one of the big factors that kept Jeff closeted above his pay grade at the Times. So with his peers or with the reporters he oversaw, he's willing to be out and be very open. But if it was someone who was Jeff's manager, someone up to the top of the paper, like the executive editor, Abe Rosenthal, who was widely felt to be homophobic and who held Jeff's career in his hands, then Jeff was absolutely in the closet. And so part of what really came through in working on Dying Words, the documentary and the book, interviewing all these people who'd worked around Jeff, talking to his family, who well, actually his one sister and brother-in-law, his only living relatives, about him, is that when Jeff got stricken by AIDS, it was a death sentence, but it was also a complete liberation. And it was a liberation from not only being in the closet, but a liberation from some of the stylistic constraints he had felt writing for the Times. Up until that point, and I say this with all the love and respect I have for Jeff, but I'd have to say, until he switched to covering AIDS, his concern about what his writing style would be like was absolutely on point. He wrote perfectly correct, you know, punctiliously done traditional New York Times stories. Perfect, but kind of formulaic. And then when he got AIDS and started covering AIDS, he became that person who was constantly pushing against the limits of style and voice and repertorial engagement and making this incredibly exciting journalism as a result. We're talking with Sam Friedman, who's a professor of journalism at Columbia, and he's also the author of Dying Words, the Age Reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz, and co-producer of a new radio documentary which shares the same title. He joins us today from a studio at NPR in Midtown Manhattan, and this is where we live. So this turning point for, for Jeff came at, in some ways, at the worst possible time. It, he was able to be liberated because he got very, very sick, and it happened uh, right in the middle of the newsroom. Can you tell us a bit about this? This is a Friday afternoon in December 1990. It's the last Friday before Christmas week, and Jeff's on the national desk. At this point, he's deputy national editor, continuing to rise up the ladder. As I've been able to put together by looking at the next day's newspaper, it was kind of a slow day on the national desk. The big stories were all foreign stories. But at some point in the mid to late afternoon, Jeff stands up because he thinks he's dizzy and collapses with a stud on the floor. And immediately, you know, ambulances are called and paramedics are called and the newsroom comes to halt around him. The new executive editor, not new at this point, but the one who replaced Abe Rosenthal, Max Frankel, very compassionate person. Max is sitting with Jeff and holding his hand. Some people in the newsroom who knew Jeff was gay are already thinking, this could be HIV. This could be AIDS. No one knows for sure yet. But then Jeff goes off to the hospital to get tested, and that begins what will be a process of several months of testing that ends up with this terrible, tragic confirmation that not only is he HIV positive, but he has full-blown AIDS. He literally has a T-cell count of two. You're supposed to have somewhere upwards of 1,000. Mm. Let's actually hear a, a clip from the documentary, and this is uh, Jeff in his own words describing the incident from a 1993 interview. Suddenly, my vision started to go. I, I couldn't see the screen well, and I stood up. I thought, if I can just get some air, I'll be all right. I collapsed to the floor and went into a full-blown uh, seizure, grand mal seizure, in the middle of the newsroom. And so that's what then started everything. Jeff was soon diagnosed with AIDS, making him just one of nearly 8,000 people to be stricken by the incurable disease that year in New York City alone. Months later, Jeff was able to return to work with a changed perspective. And when he did, he had a mission. I feel an obligation to those with AIDS to write about it and an obligation to the newspaper to write what just about no other reporter in America can cover in quite the same way. And I feel an obligation to myself. This is the place reporting where I'm at home. This is the place where I must come to terms with AIDS. And again, those are the words of Jeffrey Schmaltz uh, talking. 
in a documentary called Dying Words. Um, maybe you can give us some context. We've talked a bit about this, Sam, but but how was AIDS being written and talked about in America at the time, and specifically at the New York Times when, when Jeff Schmaltz decided to, to make this change in the way he was going to tell the story of AIDS? Well, by the time Jeff has this seizure in late 1990, the AIDS epidemic has been known for close to a decade, but it's still seen as this alien, scary, othered thing because the initial group of cases take place among gays. Of course, a lot of people, including the New York Times, don't even use the term gay then. They're still hanging on to the term homosexual, which has this pejorative tone, which tells you something right there. And so there was a sense, as more came to be known about how it was transmitted, that this is something gay people have brought on themselves with their reckless sex lives. This is God's punishment on them. You have people saying, now, the New York Times, no one was talking about God's punishment, but the way the Times covered the AIDS story, the slowness of it, the way the stories initially were put way back deep inside the paper, was a reflection of the fact that this was seen as a disease of others, of this alien, strange population who was not like us. You know, for our book and documentary, we interviewed Eric Marcus, who is a journalist and historian who's written a great deal about the gay rights movement and was working in newsrooms during the early years of the AIDS epidemic. And what Eric said is totally true, that had the AIDS epidemic been hitting PTA moms, now it's the example Eric uses, the, the Times would have had the AIDS story on page one. Because it was gays, it went to literally page 20. So from early on, that sent two messages. One, the gay community in New York, particularly as it began to get organized and had activist groups like ACT UP forming, was highly incensed by the Times' uh, coverage of AIDS or, or lack thereof. And the message to gay and lesbian people in the Times newsroom was that this paper that we've, you know, given our professional lives to, in some way doesn't really care about what happens to us. And that began to change partly through some of Jeff's efforts to, as I mentioned before, stealthily get stories into the paper written by reporters who were straight but who were sympathetic, but ultimately changed more when Abe Rosenthal retired and when Punch Sulzberger, who was then the publisher, began to yield his power to his son, Arthur Sulzberger Jr., and Max Frankel became executive editor. And these were people who were much more enlightened on gay life in general and coverage of AIDS in particular and felt there was a lot of catching up to do. But I have to say that even that improvement did not uh, quell the criticism from ACT UP, which continued you know, on into the time Jeff was covering the AIDS beat in the early 90s. It, tell us some specifics, if you would, about the ways in which he, he was able to transform the paper's coverage, the the tone that was used in the reporting, the words that were used, even the story selection is something that it, it truly did mark quite a shift for this paper that you quite rightly suggested was um, so methodical in the way it did so many things and was so slow to the punch in telling stories like, like these. Jeff's work occurred at a really important moment in time. And I think the timing plus the tone plus the megaphone of being the New York Times adds up to Jeff's tremendous influence when he was writing these stories. I say the time because Jeff is taking on the AIDS beat. In fact, he's creating the AIDS beat at the time. So there was no such thing as an AIDS beat before this. He's doing it at this point in the early 90s when the realization is coming through that you can't get a wise AIDS as a disease, quote-unquote, just of, of gay people, that people who are living heterosexual lives, females, all kinds of wide-ranging people, kids are getting AIDS. And Jeff is writing about the whole span, the whole spectrum of Americans who are dying of AIDS, everyone from Magic Johnson, well, who is HIV, it never became full-blown AIDS, so let's say HIV slash AIDS, Magic Johnson, Mary Fisher, a Republican political um, operative, um, Bob Hatoy, a gay man who's in the Clinton administration, writers like Randy Schultz and Harold Brodkey, 
he's just covering the waterfront in terms of who this disease afflicts. And what he's capturing is a humanity in them. He's really giving us as readers, these people as human beings, in a way very little of the even good AIDS coverage done up to that point in American journalism had been able to do. And it was amazing in working on this documentary to hear the micro cassette recordings that Jeff made of his interviews. His sister, Wendy Schmals, hung on to those micro cassettes, and we listened to them, Kerry Donahue and, and uh, I, while we we're doing our research. And in the interviews, you can hear Jeff both questioning these people with the incredible compassion of someone who shares their disease or their HIV status, but also a fearlessness because he can also ask any really tough question because he has as much skin in this game as you possibly could. And so it's a mixture in the articles of extraordinary intimacy and tenderness and yet an extraordinary unflinchingness. And then the third element besides the time and the tone is this is the power of the New York Times. The Times these days is still an enormously influential news organization. But if you go back to 1992 and 1993, no internet, no social media to spread news other ways, no you know, people checking things on their smartphones, the power of a legacy news organization like the New York Times was exponentially greater than it is even now. And so when Jeff started doing these stories in the New York Times, the whole news industry pays attention and the whole news industry starts to follow and say, gee, we need to have an AIDS beat on our newspaper or on our you know, TV station or, or what have you. And that's some of the incredible effect that, that Jeff's work had. And the last thing I'll say is that it was very, very rare at that time in the New York Times for anyone other than an op-ed columnist to write in the first person. There were a handful of legendary Times articles that had been written that way. Nan Robertson won a Pulitzer for writing about her near death with toxic shock syndrome. John Darnton won a Pulitzer for write, smuggling a personal letter out of uh, Poland when the Russians, you know, clamped down with martial law against solidarity. But it was hardly ever done. And Jeff wrote two first-person pieces, one about covering AIDS while having AIDS, and the other, which was published posthumously, called Whatever Happened to AIDS, that had this tremendous impact, partly because they broached this wall that the Times had had against using the first person in its news columns. We're talking today with Sam Friedman, who's a professor of journalism at Columbia, also the author of Dying Words, The Age Reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz. He's also a co-producer of a new radio documentary, which shares the same title. He joins us today from a studio at NPR in Midtown Manhattan. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Sam Friedman here on Where We Live. This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. Today we're talking with Sam Friedman, who's a journalism professor at Columbia and also is the author of Dying Words, The Age Reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz. He's the co-producer of a new radio documentary with Kerry Donahue. It's a documentary that tells the story of Jeffrey Schmaltz and the groundbreaking work that he did on AIDS as he himself was dying of AIDS. Let's listen to a, a bit more from this documentary. One of the things that's remarkable here is getting a chance to hear him in his own words. In retrospect, I feel terrible that I wasn't more open and that I didn't speak up more and that I didn't say, wait a minute, this is outrageous. We're missing this epidemic. And I didn't. I was afraid. I was a coward, really. And one of the things that happened when I got AIDS was that I made the decision that I was not going to be timid or uh, closeted about either having AIDS or being gay and that I was going to speak out, and that I was going to use my position to help both those causes. So th there's a lot in that one uh, a quote, uh, Sam, that I'd like you to respond to. But first is this, is this notion, and I'm sure you've thought about this quite a bit, of him calling himself a coward, really. What, what's your reaction to hearing him talk about um, his decision to maybe stay in the background with this and then eventually uh, come out? both as gay and also as an AIDS activist, um, to, to saying that he, was, he felt himself a coward. 
It is intense for me to hear Jeff's voice again, and particularly to hear that clip. But Jeff had a piercing intelligence that was part of what made him a world-class journalist, and he could direct it at himself as much as at anybody else. So when I hear him saying that, I think it's sad, it's self-lacerating, but it's also true. It's not self-pitying because it's accurate, and it's not self-pitying or morose because in the time Jeff had left, once he came to that realization, he made use of that time to, I think, more than compensate for the cowardice and I would say maybe the, the careerism that had kept him closeted for a longer time than many other colleagues in the newsroom felt compelled to be closeted. Mm. It's just it's it's interesting that his desire to have a career at this great institution may well have in some ways influenced the institution's own uh, reticence to cover this important part of his life and and just hearing him grapple with that his own in some ways complicity with 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 that at the times is it's heartbreaking really because he seemed so dedicated to the place um in in a way it's so true you know it's hard for young people particularly today and I have kids who are 21 and 23 so I know this generation well they've grown up thank god in such a more tolerant time around LGBT issues, it's hard for them to conceive of what it was like to be whipsawed the way the gay journalists of Jeff's generation, of course, gays in other fields as well, felt whipsawed between the professional ambition that their talents entitled them to have and this tremendous fear of what the punishment would be. And it wasn't sort of idle paranoia. One of Jeff's colleagues, a super talented foreign correspondent named Rich Meislin, who people thought might be destined to run the paper one day. When he got sick, severely sick while he was Mexico City bureau chief, it wasn't AIDS, but rumors, because some people knew Rich was gay, began going through the newsroom that it was AIDS. And when Abe Rosenthal found out that Rich Meislin was gay, which he hadn't known to that point, all of a sudden you go from being Mexico City bureau chief to being bucked back to private, i.e. being put on the Metro desk, which was for starting reporters like me, not for veterans like Rich Meislin. And even in Jeff's case, he had done this brilliant behind-the-scenes orchestration of the first really long article the Times did about gay life in New York during the AIDS era that wasn't exoticizing anything, but that also really took readers literally into the bathhouses and the clubs but also the living rooms and the offices and everywhere else where gay New Yorkers were. And Jeff had a terrific writer on Metro named Michael Norman write that story. He chose Mike partly because Mike was just an awesome writer. But also Mike was a Vietnam vet, married with two kids living in the Jersey suburbs, kind of a macho guy. So no one was going to think that Mike Norman was doing any favors for, you know, for gay folks. And Jeff knew that. He leveraged that impression by signing Mike the story. But even with all of Jeff's efforts to get that story in without it looking like he had his hand on the scale, helping to make it happen, very suspiciously, a couple months after Mike's story ran, Jeff was taken off the Metro desk and sent to cover Connecticut. And people knew Jeff wanted to become a reporter, so that was what made it at one level plausible. And I've no, I'm not dissing being in the Connecticut Bureau of the New York Times, started there myself. But that's exactly what it was, a place where generally you went early in your career to get some experience. If you're Jeff Schmals and you already have been on the New York Times for almost 10 years and you're a rising star, when they switch you over to a writing job, they're going to make you a bureau chief somewhere. They're going to send you to, to cover Congress. They're going to send you overseas. They're not going to send you to write about Greenwich and Stanford. And so that was one of the things that Jeff realized is that even though he hadn't come out, or certainly not to people above him, there was enough suspicion that he was gay, that he was up for being punished and for having kind of the career track that he deserved derailed. I, I want to actually ask you about a, a profile that he did. You mentioned this earlier about American activist Mary Fisher, uh, shortly before a speech to uh, the RNC. Maybe you can just give us a little bit of the significance of Mary Fisher at that time and what was important about this interview. One of the uh, first really major profiles Jeff did on the AIDS beat was of Mary Fisher. This is in the summer of 1992. 
Mary Fisher is the daughter of a major Republican fundraiser and insider named Max Fisher, and she herself is very much part of, you know, the backstage world of Republican politics. She's not a candidate, but she's a significant person in fundraising, in being someone who can speak, you know, on a one-to-one basis with major office holders. And she developed HIV. She became HIV positive. And the whole AIDS issue began to become very, very politicized in the 92 presidential race. The Democrats have their convention earlier than the Republicans do in the summer of 1992. And they have a speaker named Elizabeth Glazer at their convention, a mom who has AIDS. I believe she contracted it through a transfusion. And it's very moving. And it's meant to show that the Democratic Party is sympathetic to what gays and other Americans with AIDS are going through. And it's an implied promise to try to do more work on research about AIDS. So then the Republican convention comes up and Mary Fisher, who's HIV positive, is asked to give a speech, which immediately puts her in this really torn up position between giving the speech she wants to give, which is to, you know, a very full-throated testament to the humanity of people with AIDS and call for the federal government to be involved in trying to find a cure versus a lot of pressures, particularly from the right wing of the Republican Party, not to let her speak, not to ever say anything that's going to look like some kind of Republican, you know, tolerance for for gay people or for deviant behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And into the welter of feelings Mary Fisher already has, here comes Jeff Schmalz, who by reputation she knows is this tough-minded, hard-hitting reporter to come and do a profile of her. And here's a clip of Jeff talking about and reading from his profile of Mary Fisher. When I first uh, wrote about her, I was rather antagonistic. I mean, I really confronted her and said, you know, how can you speak at this Republican convention when these Republicans have done nothing for AIDS? Enter now Mary Fisher, very rich, very Republican, and very much infected with the virus that causes AIDS. With her shoulder-length blonde hair styled just so, Ms. Fisher is right out of Republican central casting the Muffy Buffy Jody look writ expensive. And why not? Her Republican credentials are impeccable. I knew what I looked like, but I, you know, I didn't like that description of me. But then other than that, I thought that the article was really right on, and I thought he was very honest. Ms. Fisher, who so far has not had any AIDS-related illnesses, is caught between the worlds of Republican politics and AIDS activism, both of them at times uneasy about her. It's such an interesting back and forth between the two. And I'll, I'll also say, Sam, that it, it I think it shows another thing that that Jeff and I'm sure many other journalists were caught between was this notion that if if we're going to tell the story of AIDS through the lens of an everyday American pie uh, woman uh, who we wouldn't think of as part of the um, in quotes, homosexual underground that that it takes it takes the story away from some reality. And I'm sure that this is something that Jeff and his reporting had to grapple with all the time, that there are there were ways in which American politicians were trying to appropriate the AIDS crisis to their own ends that in, in many cases had very little to do with what was actually going on in his community and with his his friends and loved ones. I, I agree with you. There was a risk at that time that AIDS was going to be divided into sort of the deserving victims and the undeserving victims. And if a child like Ryan White got AIDS through a transfusion, he was an undeserving victim. If uh, a mom got it through a transfusion, that was an undeserving victim. But if you were, you know, a gay American male and in all likelihood you contracted it through sexual behavior, even if that behavior had taken place long before any of the health warnings were even out about AIDS, then you were a quote-unquote deserving victim. And I think part of Jeff's brilliance in the profiles he chose to do was that he never limited himself to the quote-unquote deserving victims. He made sure that we really felt the full humanity of Harold Brodke, of Randy Schiltz, of Tom Stoddard, Bob Hattoy, Larry Kramer, all of of the gay men who he interviewed. So he was not selective, and he didn't want readers 
and the public to be selective about who they felt empathy for. Um, as he became bolder as a journalist, uh, he crossed over into this first-person piece uh, that we've referenced already, a piece for the Week in Review about what it was like to have AIDS and report on it. And let's listen to a bit of Jeff Schmaltz talking in this documentary. I just came in one morning and sat down and wrote it. And I took it over to Joe Lelyveld, who's the managing editor, and I said, I've written this piece. He came over a little while later and said, we'll print it. And that was it, and we put it in the newspaper. That piece was titled, A Reporter's Testimony, Covering AIDS and Living It. It ran on December 20th, 1992. Two years ago tomorrow, I collapsed at my desk in the newsroom at the New York Times, writhed on the floor in a seizure, and entered the world of AIDS. Jeff wrote about waking up in nightmares, where he was in a coffin. He wrote about his mother's death after she learned he had AIDS. He wrote about his sense of being completely alone. I make sure everyone with AIDS whom I interview knows that I have it too. To be sure that is an interview ploy, I'm hoping the camaraderie will open them up. But there is more to it than that. I want them to take a good look at me, to see that someone with full-blown AIDS can carry on for a while, can even function as a reporter. Much of the time it works. Their faces light up. There is hope. But sometimes it fails, and I am the one changed by our chat overcome by guilt that I have lived these two years when so many of my friends and hospital roommates and people I've interviewed have died. At times I think my fellow eight sufferers are laughing at me, looking up from their beds with eyes that say, you'll be here soon enough. Sam, I have a question for you about first-person journalism, but before I get to that, I'm wondering if you could just react to, to Jeff's words there. Jeff was fearless to write about your own imminent death that way is fearless. And to examine your own motives is fearless. He's unflinching on himself. He doesn't valorize himself. He knows what he's doing that's heartfelt and at the same time is somewhat manipulative. And and he owns that. And he also refuses to give himself any false hope. He knows that he's on borrowed time. As much as we've already said about how modern consumers of media might find it unusual that there was ever a time when it was so difficult to be openly gay in in a newsroom or in public life, or that there was ever a time in which um, AIDS was was talked about as this incredibly scary disease in the way that it was in the 1980s and 1990s. I think as as unusual as that might be to some young people today, there's also this notion that it was ever unusual for a reporter to write a first-person story, to just say, this is my life, this is what I've experienced, and this is how I'm going to take you through it. And you've alluded to this a little bit in our conversation, Sam, but maybe you can put a little finer point on it, because I think for for the New York Times, this was something that that took a, a bit of a leap, and it was something that changed the tone of journalism, I think, and that has certainly uh, taken quite a turn over time. Now now people aren't scared to say, this is what happened to me. That's a great question, John, and it's something I think a lot about in my journalism professor life. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, in this era of blogs and vodcasts and podcasts and putting yourself up on the having a YouTube channel for yourself and social media, it's almost revolutionarily reactionary to think that there is a time when journalists were brought up with the idea that the story is what's important. You're not important. And what I will say is that I think the rarity of this kind of first-person story gave it part of its power. It's like a precious metal or some precious stone that's hard to come by. And To flash forward to today, there's so much first-person writing that the currency is devalued. It doesn't have the impact. So here's someone else writing about what he or she thinks. But at the time Jeff was doing it, I think the Times' reluctance to do a lot of first-person writing had great effect because when you broke the fourth wall, to use the theatrical phrase, when you broke the fourth wall, then it set off just tremors because you knew as a New York Times reader and as a fellow journalist, if 
a Times person was being allowed to use the first person pronoun in the news column, then that person really had something that needed to be said that way and could only be said that way. And when you open the floodgates on it and everyone can do it, then unfortunately it becomes much harder as it is today to tease out the first person essays that really cry out to have written to have been written in the first person rather than the first person being a kind of default setting. Sam Friedman is a professor of journalism at Columbia. He's also the author of Dying Words, the AIDS reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz, and co-producer of a new radio documentary which shares the same title. Sam joins us today from the studios of NPR in Midtown Manhattan. We've got to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation about Jeff Schmaltz and his groundbreaking reporting on AIDS. This is Where We Live. This is Where We Live. I'm John Dankosky. Coming up tomorrow, of course, it's Christmas Day. So we'll be taking a break. Hope you can enjoy the day with your friends and family. We're going to be playing for you Tinsel Tales, one of the specials of great stories from NPR. Hope you can join us and a very Merry Christmas to you. Today we're talking with Sam Friedman. He is a professor of journalism at Columbia. He's also the author of Dying Words, the AIDS reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz. And he's the co-producer of a radio documentary that shares this title. It tells the stories of Jeff Schmaltz and the groundbreaking work he did in covering AIDS in America. Sam, what do you think Jeff's impact was on what we now know and what we think about AIDS? Jeff had an impact in two ways. The empathy, the compassion, coupled with the clear-headedness with which he covered AIDS, set an industry standard. And again, this is Jeff plus the multiplier effect of Jeff being on the New York Times. So he made it imperative for other news organizations to cover AIDS in that way. And it meant that even places that might have been doing a great job covering AIDS as a medical story now realized it was a human interest story, for lack of a better term, as well. The second way Jeff had a huge impact is that he tremendously sensitized the times institutionally to the lives of gays and to the issues that mattered to gays, because even though you had an enlightened leadership of the Times by the time Jeff got sick. Max Frank as executive editor, Arthur Sulzberger Jr. as publisher. And even though a couple of other Times staffers had died of AIDS by this point, and even though an increasing number of Times staffers were coming out as gay or lesbian at this point, Jeff was held in a regard that almost no one surpassed in the newsroom. So to have someone who was seen as the epitome of being a New York Times journalist stricken and then doing this kind of work was bound to just slay any of the residual bigotry, any of the residual discomfort the Times felt about LGBT individuals or about the issues. I, you know, think you have to draw a straight line that goes from Jeff to where the New York Times is now in terms of its editorial pages leadership on marriage equality, and lately on trans inclusion and all all these issues. The paradox, though, John, and this is one of the things that drove me to do the documentary, is that as profound as Jeff's impact was in its own time, it's been largely forgotten since then. And I think some of this has to do with the fact that even when you're writing for the New York Times, Writing for a newspaper means writing for something that's evanescent, that the peers of Jeff's in doing this kind of work, Larry Kramer as a playwright, Randy Schultz as a nonfiction book writer, Andrew Sullivan as an essayist and author, you know, somewhat younger, but same thing, Tony Kushner as a playwright, plays and books have a permanence that newspaper journalism and magazine journalism almost never has. You can't pull Jeff's work 
off a bookshelf. Now you can, for which I'm very proud to play a part. But you couldn't in the intervening 22 years since he died. And I think that makes it easier for people to forget what he did and what impact it had. I think the other reason is that the upside is that our society, particularly in the last, say, five to seven years, has moved forward on gay issues really at tremendous speed. I lived through the civil rights years, or many of them, and the pace of change on racial issues was much slower than the pace of change we've had, I think, on many gay issues once some kind of critical mass was achieved maybe four or five years ago. But because we now have marriage equality as the law of the land and there are prominent gay people in politics and in sports and in popular culture and in every facet of our society, you can forget how different it was in the very recent past. And if you're an alert college student or millennial now, fortunately for you, but maybe unfortunately for our collective national memory, you've never known a time when things weren't relatively tolerant. I guess without uh, engaging in too much nostalgia for newspapers, though, I'll, I'll say that while... Well, feel free. I'll, jo- I'll join you in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I guess the one thing that, that the New York Times certainly had and still has to this day, even though, you know, more people look at it online on their iPad than, uh, than they used to, is that unlike a, a great play or a, a, a song or a movie that is written about something that may last forever, uh, those things weren't delivered to your doorstep every day. I mean, that wasn't part of a national conversation uh, for everyone, and that's what his reporting in The New York Times did, right? It, it helped to galvanize people who wouldn't ever think that they would have to confront this story. They had to confront it because it was there at their kitchen table every morning, right? I think that's a great point. You know, I sometimes say that a newspaper like the New York Times or the Hartford Current, the Boston Globe, these are like department stores. And when you went into an old-fashioned department store, Macy's or, you know, Marshall Fields, Bambergers, you name it, you trusted the store to decide what products they thought you should have a look at. If you didn't go in there thinking, gee, I really need to get a scarf, they'd have scarves there because they're thinking it's early December. People should be shopping for scarves. <laughs> and I think the leadership role that newspapers played, particularly, as you said, when it was home delivered, is we're going to decide what you should know. Even if sitting at home, you don't think it's important to read a profile of someone with AIDS that will make you think about AIDS in a different way. We think it's important for you to know that. And even today, and I celebrate actually the fact that journalism can be consumed so easily through smartphones and tablets and everything else. I do it myself. But there's much more of a sense of everyone creates their own news organization. Everyone handpicks what they want to read or look at. And the curatorial role that journalism has, you know, has diminished a lot since this period of time we're talking about with Jeff Schmaltz. Hmm. Sam Friedman is a professor of journalism at Columbia. He's also the author of Dying Words, The Age Reporting of Jeffrey Schmaltz and co-producer of a new radio documentary which shares the same title. We'll have links on our website, wnpr.org slash where we live. Sam Friedman joined me today from a studio at NPR in Midtown Manhattan. Sam Friedman, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, John, I'm really humbled by this opportunity. Thank you. Our program is produced by Lydia Brown and Tucker Ives. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf, WNPR's digital editor is Heather Brandon, and our executive producer is Katie Talarski. Continue this conversation on our website, wnpr.org slash where we live. I'm John Dankosky, and thanks for joining us.